Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, known as Laetare Sunday, from the first word of the introit today. You know that rose-colored vestments are permitted. Actually, the word used by the, ch- by the church is tolerated today. The rose-colored vestments are tolerated uh, as a concession to human weakness, actually, to uh, show the had midway point in Lent, that we are halfway through the Lenten season and halfway toward the Easter season, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. All too often, the rose-colored vestments are more pink than rose, though, unfortunately. So I <clears throat> prefer the actual universal law of the church, which is to continue and wear the purple during the Sundays and Lent. Now the epistle for this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 4, verses 22 to 31. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are said by an allegory, For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering unto bondage, which is Hagar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which hath affinity to that Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry out, thou that travailest not. For many are the children of the desolate, more than of her that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the Spirit, so also it is now. But what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free, by the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles that which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Pasch, the festival day of the Jews, was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes, and seen that a very great multitude coming to him, he said to Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that everyone may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, saith to him, There is a boy here that hath five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, in like manner also of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up, therefore, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now these men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of a truth the prophet that is to come into the world. Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. (laughs) 
Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, today we have another couple of brothers presented to us in the epistle. Earlier this Lent, we had actually two sets of brothers given to us in sacred scripture. We had Jacob and Esau. We had the prodigal son and his older brother. And today we have the two brothers who are given to us here. And they represent today the two testaments. The testaments, which you call the, the Old and the New Testaments. And uh, St. Paul, writing to the Galatians, uses them as living examples of the two testaments, of the Old and the New. Because one, he says, as a slave, resembles the slavery of the Old Testament. To be bound by the rules and rituals not understood. And not motivated so much by love, but motivated by a certain fear. There is a slavery in that, but it is our Lord and his teaching to us of God's love for us that actually sets us free from that. It enables us to do our own wills and not to feel compelled except by love. In other words, when we love, we do what we do for the beloved out of our own free will because we love them. And that makes all the difference. And so it is with us as traditional Catholics. What, what we do must be a labor of love. If it is not a labor of love, it will seem like drudgery. But if it seems that way to us, the solution is not to lose or give up our faith, but to find that love in our hearts for God that will enable us to practice our faith lovingly. That's really the solution. It really does come down to a matter of love for God, ultimately. The difficult thing about this is, for those who have a certain love for God, maybe not perfect, of course, but a certain love for God, you can talk to them about love for God, and they understand what you mean. There are others who don't have love for God, or very little of it, and when you talk about love for God, they, they don't understand what you mean. Um, because they, they can't experience what it means to, have a, to love God. What they need to do, then, is to pray. They need to make an act of the will to want to love God and to ask God to give them that love, to open their hearts to receive the grace to make that love possible for them. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, shows us God's love for us. He not only spoke of God's love for us, he acted God's love for us in his miracles and, of course, in the ultimate sacrifice that he made here on the cross. He shows us very clearly the greatness of God's love for us. And our Lord's first mission here on earth was to justify us from our sins, the things in us that were a barrier against God's love, against our love for him, that is, and then to sanctify us again in the love of God. Our Lord wanted to sanctify us not only in our love for God, he wants to sanctify us in our love for each other too. You know that in the Old Testament, again, as Hagar represents, we have the statement revealed by God through Moses, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But at the Last Supper, our Lord told his apostles, a new commandment I give you, now that you love each other as I have loved you, which is a very different thing, a greater thing, a holier thing, than merely to love according to the standard of our self-love. Now we have the love of Christ as a standard of our love, even for each other. So our Lord wanted to sanctify our love for him, for God, our Lord wanted to sanctify our love for our fellow men, too. This is the meaning of the gospel. All the prophets and all the laws are summarized in these two great commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole mind, thy whole soul, and thy whole strength. 
And now thou shalt love thy neighbor as I have loved you. Now, we find in the gospel today our Lord performing another miracle. And this miracle is a matter of feeding thousands in the desert. This is very impressive. It's one thing to walk on water and to heal the sick, but to take a little bit of food and to multiply it before their very eyes so that they can almost see the multiplication going on before them. They certainly saw the results. And to be all easting, feasting there in the wilderness so that they were filled. Not just that each one took a little. Remember, Philip, the apostle, said that it would cost basically a full year's wages by a normal blue-collar working man, a 200 denarii worth of worth of bread would not have been enough to give them each a little taste of it. We're talking about thousands of people. And yet, there our Lord effortlessly, it seems, fed them. And fed them to the filled, until they were filled, until they could eat no more. And there were twelve basketfuls of food left, much more than they had started with. And this was an obvious miracle, so obvious that again, the people were moved to do something remarkable. They wanted to take our Lord by force and make him their king, which would have had the result of bringing down the wrath of Rome upon them and, as far as they were concerned, certain death. But they saw the power in our Lord and they were so completely they were so completely preoccupied with what our Lord had done that they saw that he was worthy to be their king. Remember now, it wouldn't be that many days afterwards that those people would be gathered in the courtyard of the Antonia Palace of Pontius Pilate, seeing our Lord crowned with thorns and a purple robe soaked with his blood over his shoulders crying out, away with him, crucify him. We don't want to be like them, calling him our Lord one day and then calling for his death by our sins. We don't want to be like them and praying to the same Lord, Jesus Christ, honor him as our Savior, one prayer, and then later on that same day, offending him, by grave sin. So we see that people can be very fickle in their allegiances. And again, it is a lack of love that makes them so. There we find the groundwork, there we find the foundation of our loyalty to our Lord. So this, this Lent, we are meant to make sacrifices, yes, we are meant to be justified from our sins by the power of Christ, in the confessional especially, to make a good confession, to try to make the best confessions we've ever made, which means the confessions that are motivated by the greatest love for our Lord, and to receive the sacraments and be sanctified by the power of Christ. We must be sanctified by him too. I do ask you, please, to take part in the 40 Days for Life. That is a perfect exercise to undertake for Lent, a Lenten offering that you can make to our Lord for Him, to stand out there in the cold and in public and to be a living testimony to your faith in our Lord, your hope in Him, and your love for Him, and His rights. If you want to do something for yourself, your own soul, your family, to inspire them, and your country to make reparation for the sins of your country, and to plead for her deliverance as we stand on the very edge of the precipice of coming elections, this is one thing you certainly can do which would be of very meritorious in the eyes of God to be there at Planned Parenthood today, to stand up for the life that God has given 
and make reparation for all of the evil sins that are committed, from the murder of abortion to the adulteries and fornications that lead to those abortions, where the abortions begin. Also, you can sign up for the Rosary Crusade today. Again, you don't have to stand out in the cold for that, but to kneel here before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. He is here out of love for you. You can be here out of love for Him. Again, something you can do for Lent that is a very important statement of yours, professing your love for God, or at least your desire to love Him. We have around us the opportunities to show that love for God. We should take those opportunities every, every day. My dear faithful, we are called upon during this day, during this our day, the time of our lives here, to be faithful and to stand firmly with our Lord. Ask your Lord for the grace to understand greater, more and more greatly the wonder of his love for you, to understand and to appreciate that, to open your hearts to his grace to love him also more and more, to be more and more loyal and faithful to him day by day. Show that in your daily lives, and you'll reap a great harvest in your own families. You parents, stand up and be the parent you were meant to be. We have a number of weddings going to take place in the next few months. And whenever you hear these announcements of the weddings, you parents should think about your own wedding days long ago and realize how much more important it was for you to have a blessed marriage than it was to have a nice wedding. Because often it is possible, often we find that people focus most of all on having a a uh, perfect wedding and need to focus on also also having the perfect marriage. What does that mean to have the perfect marriage? Well, it means to have the marriage where the husband and the wife truly love each other with a supernatural love. It means that uh, the, the man realizes that the most important thing he can do is, well, I should put it this way, the second most important thing he can do for his children, his children yet to be born, is to provide for them the best mother he can possibly give them. And for the woman who's marrying, the second most important thing that she can do is to provide for her coming children the best father that she can give them. But the most important thing that either of them can do, the most important thing that the father, the man can do, is to provide the best father that he can give them. And the most important thing that the woman can do is to provide the best, best mother she can give her children. And so the father and the mother-to-be as they stand before their altar, pronouncing their marriage vows, should be thinking about what they want to bring to their families, what they want to give to their children there at the altar. And every man who has any aspiration to becoming a father should have an idea, a very clear idea, of what he wants his sons to be, what he wants his future sons to become, after all, when we're planning a great work, we have to look ahead and we have to see what we want the result to be. What is it we want to be the end product of all of our work, all of our labor, all of our thought, all of our effort? And so when a man gets married, he should be thinking in terms of the kind of children he wants to have and what the kind of men and women he wants them to grow up to be. What is the end result? What is, what is the... What is the goal of his married life? First and foremost, it should be the lives he is to bring into the world. 
And so every man who gets married, or has intentions of marrying, should have a, an idea of the kind of man he would want his sons to become. And then he needs to be that man. That father-to-be needs to be that man, the very man he wants his own sons to be someday. If he cannot be that man, how on earth, and what right does he have to expect that any of his sons will ever be the man that he hopes he will be, that his father will hope him to become? And the same with the woman. The woman who marries or intends to marry and has children someday should have an idea. What does she want her children to be? What does she want her daughters to become? She should think about the kind of woman she would want her daughter to be. And then she should be that woman now. She should be that woman right here and right now. And if she will not be the kind of woman she wants her daughter to become, what right does she have to expect that her daughter will ever, any of her daughters will ever become that woman? She hopes so much will come from her, from her life, from her married life, from her family. I beg you, so it is with all of us. We have to have an idea of the ultimate result of our lives, what we're striving for. We have to have that goal in mind. During Lent, in a particular way, we focus on that purpose we have, the ultimate purpose of our lives which goes beyond the food on our table or in our refrigerators, goes beyond the clothes hanging in our closets, goes beyond the money in our wallets and our bank accounts. It is a matter of our lives, which are more than any of these things. And that, my dear faithful, comes down to our Lord Jesus Christ and the life that he wants to give you. It is yours for the taking. It was very easy, you might think, for Eve to reach out and take that forbidden fruit and cause all the damage that has been done. It was very easy for her to take that and to reach it toward Adam and offer it to him. But our Lord has put within your reach eternal life now. And the question is whether you will reach out and take that, take that eternal life that he offers you. As God said after Adam and Eve fell, let us see now whether man will take of the tree of life and eat and have everlasting life. Well, that tree of life is nothing other than the cross of our Lord. There we find true life. There alone we can find the life of God given for us so that it could be given to us. Reach out and take that life into your soul. Faith, hope, and the love for God is what gives you that life. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.